Bob Zellner, thank you so much for joining us. What a pleasure to be chatting with you. It's very good to be chatting with you. Now, you were born and raised in Alabama. Son of the South is set in Alabama, one of the many epicenters of the civil rights movement of the 1960s. Can you paint a picture for us of what life was like back in Alabama during that time? Well, life was uh, during the uh, 1950s and the 1960s in uh, Alabama was uh, a little bit like uh, the few years prior to the Civil War, because uh, in the 1950s, uh, we had the Supreme Court decision uh, outlawing segregation in public schools, and there was a tremendous uh, leap forward in uh, uh, civil rights for people of color. And uh, there was massive resistance in the South. The South just said, we're not gonna do it. And um, there was a resurgence of terrorist groups like the uh, Ku Klux Klan. Mm. And uh, it was also a time when there was very little tolerance for any dissent on the part of white Southerners. So. The segregationists uh, felt that if they could keep everybody in line and keep a united front of all white people claiming to support segregation and racial, mm. racial hatred, that they would have a better chance of prevailing. So any dissent was uh, severely punished. Wow. And what made you look at the divide between races, made you look at that segregation and see it as something that was wrong and something that you wanted to help change? Well, one of the biggest influences uh, in my attitude and my beliefs was the fact that my father, uh, having been an organizer for the Ku Klux Klan and um, coming from a Ku Klux Klan family, his father and his whole uh, family were um, staunch uh, Ku Klux Klan people. Yeah, and when dad began to uh, question the, his beliefs as a Klansman and began to uh, try to uh, leave the Ku Klux Klan, he was uh, threatened. Mm. And when he did leave the Ku Klux Klan, he was disowned by his own father and mother and his brothers never spoke to him again in, in his entire life. Wow. And that, that can't have been easy for him. And I think also not easy for you as the grandson of someone who was still so heavily involved in the Ku Klux Klan to do something so different from it. So how did you, how did you manage to go against your family heritage and stay true to the things that you felt compelled to be part of? Well, one, one thing that made it uh, easier for me to do that is that I got involved uh, very early on uh, while I was still in college with uh, the young people who were uh, sitting in at the lunch counters and doing the freedom rides. And they were actually uh, risking their lives for uh, a change in the racial situation in the United States. So that when I um, decided to join them as an ally, I was making an implicit uh, pledge that I would be a faithful ally. Hmm. And they always thought that since I was a white Southerner, that at any time I could just simply decide to go back to being white with uh, the, all of the advantages that white uh, came with. And so part of my... Uh, uh, a commitment and determination was that I would be a trustworthy ally and I would continue and not uh, go back to being a, a person with white advantage. Mm. Mm. And I think in acknowledging, you, you know, that, that being white doesn't inherently make you bad or inherently make you against people of other races, I think for many white people, there's also difficult family histories to reconcile with the fact that in your instance, you were connected to the Ku Klux Klan. And for many of us, our ancestors, to some degree, may have been involved in the oppression of other races. For you, did you did you see your actions as a young man supporting the civil rights movement as something that somehow was correcting some of the mistakes of the past? Uh, yes, I did. And uh, to take it even further, 
I saw it as uh, not so much the responsibility of the my uh, black brothers and sisters, but it was my responsibility as a white person because uh, the racial problem, uh, as we were given an assignment in college to study the racial problem and write a thesis about solutions to the problem, um, I thought I knew that uh, it was white people that were the problem. So mm -hmm. it was my responsibility as a white person to do anti-racism work. And uh, I, I found out very early on that the young uh, black people in the movement were somewhat impatient with uh, white people coming in and saying, uh, please explain this to me and how can I, how can I change myself? we had to begin to do that among ourselves. So that was the task that I took. And my first job with SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, was to be a campus traveler and to go around to all of the campuses in the South um, with an emphasis on church campuses because uh, that was where uh, there were some committed young people who felt it was their duty to um, begin to um, bridge the racial divides and bring people together rather than keep them separate. Uh, that was my first job in the movement was to uh, do anti-racism work with young white Southerners. So wow. that, was, uh, that was a good thing for me to do, especially coming from uh, a background of uh, somewhat Christian fundamentalism in my family. Both my parents were graduates of Bob Jones College, which was a very, um, conservative, uh, uh, reactionary, uh, evangelical um, college and now a university. So uh, it, was, it was easy for me, or it made it easier to go to places and say, you know, I'm, I'm the campus traveler for SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and here's what's going on, and it's very exciting. And um, if you uh, want to get involved, we have a way that you can do that. Mm, yeah, it, it very much puts you as somebody who is taking proactive steps to assist rather than, you know, being being an onlooker or a bystander, I suppose. And one of the things, I mean, you've mentioned the connection to faith in your own story. And I think for Christians right around the world, it can be challenging when you see that there there can be this link between Christianity and white supremacy. And I don't know how that happened. I don't think there's a scriptural basis for that. But do you have any insight into why sometimes it seems like Christianity and white supremacy do go hand in hand? Well, I do have some, some thoughts on that. In fact, uh, since I've my undergraduate degree was in sociology and psychology, and uh, I went back uh, later on to do PhD work in history. So I've studied where does this connection between Christianity and, uh, and segregation and apartheid, where does it come from? And it actually comes from the doctrine of discovery. So now when I lecture on college campuses, I ask uh, how many people have ever heard of the doctrine of discovery? And very few people have in the United States. And that, that was uh, promulgations by the church, by the Catholic church uh, during the age of discovery, uh, where the, the Pope said that if you find uh, countries, uh, new lands where people don't know uh, Christ, they don't know Jesus, then you have a right to um, force them to be uh, convert to be Christians. You can take their gold, you can take their land. And that's what the United States was based on, was taking the land from the people that were already here, the indigenous people. And that was done uh, under the doctrine of discovery. Uh, we are Christians and we have a right to this land. So we claim this land, even though you were here, we do it according to the doctrine of discovery. Right, and so it's almost like that kind of, it's, it, I, I sort of interpret that to be, we're trying to be evangelical, but because we're stepping in and being almost dominant, it then kind of ends up reading more as a takeover as opposed to a sharing of faith. That's true. And uh, in fact, uh, the slaveholders and the slave traders 
they had a dilemma from the very beginning because part of their uh, reason for uh, instituting the, the system of slavery was to convert people. And yet, um, if they did uh, convert the enslaved people to Christianity, then they began to read the Bible and they read about uh, Moses uh, taking the children of Israel out of slavery in, uh, in Egypt and bringing them to the promised land. So they actually had to change the Bible. They had to take a lot of the sections out uh, about uh, freeing the slaves and welcoming the stranger mm. and uh, visiting the people on, in prison and taking care of the sick and the poor. Wow. They had to take all that out uh, because the um, enslaved people would read that and they'd say, oh, well, we need to get our own liberation. And mm. um, as Moses led the children out of Israel, uh, the abolitionists will lead us out of slavery. Wow. It's just, uh, it's a really difficult part of history to really get your head around, but it's so important that we address it, I think, as well. And particularly being a white man back in the 1960s and engaged in the civil rights movement as you were, what I love in Son of the South is that we see the way that you you kind of go through that thought process of, am I going to step up or not? Is this really my fight to be part of? Who am I as the outsider to be involved? I don't want to be the white hero, all of these things. How did you step over those thoughts and say, you know what, I am going to be involved and also still be respectful to the people whose culture was really at the forefront of these movements? Well, it was uh, it was a, a, a dilemma that I had to work out. It was a spiritual dilemma. It was a, uh, a practical dilemma. And the first uh, staff meeting that I went to of the uh, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee was in Macomb, Mississippi, where uh, one of our workers, Herbert Lee, had been murdered because he went to attempt to register to vote. And his next door neighbor, a member of the Mississippi legislature, uh, followed him to the cotton gin in Liberty, Mississippi, and said, uh, how dare you try to register to vote and shot him to death. Mm. So when I went to my first staff meeting, uh, 130 students from the Berglund High School, these are high school students, walked out of school to go down and protest the murder of Herbert Lee. Wow. And um, so I was confronted with, in my first staff meeting, I hear these uh, young high school students are about to go into um, one of the most clan infested, uh, violent uh, areas of Mississippi and going to, uh, they were going to protest the murder of Herbert Lee and the expulsion of some of the high school students who had been on the freedom ride. And so I said to myself, well, I can't go because I'll be arrested mm. and uh, I won't be able to do my work of campus traveling because if I get arrested, they won't let me on any white campuses. And I said, my mother is a school teacher. She'll lose her job. My father will lose his church. And uh, there'll be more violence than usual. And then I realized I'm talking to myself because nobody's telling me to go on the march. <laughs> and, but then I thought, well, what's going to happen to these young people? Uh, what's going to happen to their mother and father? Are they going to lose their jobs? Or are they going to be uh, suffer from, from their children going down and being arrested in a demonstration. And then I realized if I was going to be a part of this movement, I had to be in it all the way. Mm. And I never would have done any good in the civil rights movement if I hadn't taken that, that step, if I hadn't decided to go on the march. And uh, sure enough, I was, it was a tremendous amount of violence and I was almost hanged that day as part of the story of the movie. So. Yeah, you, you've certainly been through a lot and yet you're here to tell the story. And I wonder from your perspective, do you think it distracted from what the black communities were trying to do that you were involved as a white man? Or do you think it bolstered their efforts having you involved? Well, um, I, I, I remember something that Bob Moses said. He was one of the main organizers in Mississippi. 
And um, uh, Moses said it was helpful to have Bob here because a lot of these young people have never seen, they've never met a sympathetic white person. Every white person they've ever met has been hateful and, uh, and meant harm to them. So he said it was very important uh, that uh, they see that there are some uh, allies uh, in, uh, in the other community. And that was always uh, part of my role was to uh, not only bring uh, young white people into the movement, but to show that uh, uh, people are are just people when you come down to it. So that was the that was the basic uh, belief that we had that everyone is equal and everyone is just a human being. And that was part of my role to uh, relate to the young people that there are some white people who are not hateful racists. Mm, yeah. And, and going into some of those days where you were attacked for your involvement, if you don't mind taking us there, what was it that happened that led up to the time where you were almost hung? Because it is so, it's so confronting to think that people from your own community would have done that. But what made them think they had to take that course of action? Well, it was uh, it was very strange because um, while I was in college, uh, there was a there was a, a veteran in college. He was older than we were, uh, but he had been a, a medic in the a Korean War, and he was uh, he was from Mississippi. In fact, he was from Macomb, Mississippi, and he was uh, a very strong. Uh, vocal supporter of the Ku Klux Klan and the, the racial hatred that was um, traditional in the South. And so he, he and I in college were uh, on kind of opposite sides and we had lots of interaction uh, while in college. So it was, uh, it was incredible that my first demonstration was in Macomb, Mississippi. I knew he was from Mississippi, but I didn't know where, and it happened to be his hometown. Mm -hmm. So he was in the mob when I was attacked and he kept uh, screaming my name and he said, I'll kill you, we'll kill you. And um, so I think that was, uh, that was one of the reasons that they were so dead set on, uh, on killing me that day. And uh, they beat me on the steps of the, of the city hall. And there was a huge mob in the street. And there was a little group of Klansmen around me. And the mob in the street kept shouting, bring him here, we'll kill him. And they started taking me bodily out to the street. And um, I, I grabbed a hold of the rail that was down the steps of the city hall. And... Um, I knew that if they did pull me loose and they got pulled me out to the street, they would they were going to kill me. They would beat me to death. They had baseball bats and pipes and chains, bricks. Um, but when they would pull, I would hold on. And when they came back to get another pull, I would move up the rail. Mm. And I worked my way all the way up to the top of the rail. And they got so frustrated, they couldn't pull me loose from the rail that somebody came over from the back of my back of my head and they started putting their fingers in my in my eye socket wow. and i realized they were trying to get a hold of my eyeball mm. so this is how fierce they were in their uh, defense of segregation that if you got out of line and descended they would blind you mm. or beat you to death and um, so it was important to to go through that. And one of the effects that it had on me was that if I survived that day, uh, the higher power must have something uh, that I'm supposed to do. Hmm. And so I, I realized that I had been so close to dying that day that everything else in my whole life would be extra. Hmm. And I'm 82 years old now, and I'm still active. Uh, my wife and I have moved back to Alabama and we're working every day to uh, bring people together 
in Alabama, and we're beginning to have a great deal of success. Mm, it's just incredible, and I think your story is inspirational. Seeing it in Son of the South is going to be such an impactful experience for so many of us. And what's amazing to me is that as you're uh, walking your own journey in this, at that time in history, you also had people like Martin Luther King Jr., Rosa Parks doing their thing as well. And we see a beautiful exchange in the movie between you and Rosa Parks. Can you tell us a little bit about her and, and her impact on your life and what she was like? Yes, uh, Mrs. Rosa Parks was one of the great influences in my life, as were a lot of very strong women one of the things we try to do in the movie is uphold the uh, strong women leadership in the movement. But um, <clears throat> I, uh, I first met uh, Mrs. Rosa Parks when I was uh, a senior in college and we were assigned to do a paper on the racial problem. And we interviewed Dr. King and, uh, and Mrs. Rosa Parks. And both of them agreed to become mentors to us, to teach us about the history of the movement. And um, <clears throat> the, the most dramatic um, influence that Mrs. Parks had on me was when five of us from my sociology class went to Reverend Abernathy's church for a nonviolent workshop. That's where we met John Lewis as well. Uh, one of the uh, great leaders of the uh, lunch counter sit-ins and the Freedom Rides. But uh, at the end of the meeting, uh, they said that the uh, church was surrounded by the police and uh, the newspapers, the press, and that the police had sent word that the five of us white students would be arrested. And um, so Dr. King said, well, what I'll do is I'll go out the front door and if they all come around here, uh, Mrs. Parks and uh, Reverend Abernathy can take you to the basement and there's a back door. Hmm. So while we were waiting for the, um, for the signal to come that Dr. King had gone out the front door, uh, Mrs. Parks turned to me and the other students and she touched me on my elbow and she said, Bob, when you uh, students, uh, you, you're not going to be able to study this forever. You're going to have to take action. Mm. And she said, something terrible is going to happen to you right in front of you. And you'll have to make a decision. Not choosing is a choice. So that was my, uh, that was my commission in the civil rights movement. And I always felt that if St. Rosa Parks uh, ask you to do something, you better get about the business of doing it. <laughs> you're certainly better. And I feel like you're never going to wash that elbow ever. But, no, uh... I've, never, I've never washed that <laughs> elbow since then. <laughs> did you Did you realize at the time that you were around such historical icons? Because I know that we look back and can see that now, but did you realize in the moment that these were going to be such history shaping influences that you were getting to be alongside? Well, no, I don't think I realized the, not how important it was going to be in history. We were just, uh, we were doing what we thought we had to do uh, at the time that we were, we were, we had to do it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was very uh, blessed and lucky that uh, Mrs. Rosa Parks and um, people like uh, uh, Ms. Eleanor Roosevelt, um, they were uh, strong women that had taken a strong stand uh, for equality, and they they just took us under their wings. We were young people, and they they let us sit in on their conversations, and they taught us a lot just by the way they talked about the uh, famous men, mm -hmm. because uh, at that time everybody paid only attention to the to the big men like Dr. King and and uh, Malcolm X and so forth. And we knew and we could tell that the women were doing most of the hard work of the, of the uh, movement in the same way they did most of the hard work in the church. Mm. So um, we learned from those wonderful women that uh, if you don't worry about who gets the credit and you just do the work, you can get a lot done and you can accomplish miracles. And they were, they were just really good to us and learning from them was uh, 
I, I, we learned the background to how we got to this point. And we also had a way to look forward to see what we can do to make it better. Mm -hmm. And it looks like with what's recently happened in the United States that we keep slipping back. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the freedom songs we had was that freedom is a constant struggle. You can't reach a point where everything is just right and it's going to stay that way. You every day you have to win a democracy. Every day you have to win the struggle for women's rights and voter rights and all those things. You have to defend them every single day. Mm. There is so much wisdom in what you've just shared, even, you know, in talking about the women that you just got to listen to and absorb their kind of lives. It's it's something for the, the older folk to make sure that you mentor people, but also for the younger ones as well, that you sit among people that you can listen to and really glean wisdom from. And as we do wrap up, Bob, I, I wonder... What do you think watching Son of the South can teach us that applies to our current circumstance now, whether it be whether it is about what we've seen recently in the States around race or anything else? What do you think we can take away from Son of the South for our modern context? Well, I think that uh, one of the things that people can take from seeing the movie is that um, every nation and every place on earth has very, very much the same problems. And uh, it's, um, if they can relate to what's happening in this movie, uh, they can relate to what's happening around them. And I remember when the, the book first was published in the middle, well, let's see, two, 2008, uh, some of the most uh, moving letters that I got were from uh, New Zealand and Australia and people saying, uh, we loved your book and it reminds us of our situation here in Australia or in New Zealand. And we are facing these same problems. And now we see that every person on earth has a uh, common uh, issue of the climate because we can't afford to have our oceans die and we can't afford to have our climate just completely get out of hand because humans are not going to be able to survive. So we're all in this struggle together and we have to look at our governments, we have to look at our economic structure and we have to change things more revolutionarily than we ever thought. Mm, hopefully it's, it's wisdom that uh, people really uh, attach on to from you, Bob. Thank you so much for your time today. And we really appreciate all that you've done for, for us in through this movie, but also, of course, everything you did in the 60s as well. It's just incredible. Thank you, Laura.